Hi everyone, my name is Thomas Tabelskis and I work as a bridge engineer at Jacobs. Thank you all for joining Fifth Midas Expert Webinar. Today I would like to talk about a particular scheme that we at Jacobs were involved in. Structure is called Eastcliff Viaduct and our main area of work included bearing replacement and associated assessment of this bridge. During this webinar, I'm aiming to go through a quick introduction, general background on East Cliff Viaduct, basics of multicellular deck behavior, how we created the village model in MIDA civil, um, sectional property calculator, application of dead and live loads, using tree menu to arrange sim and simplify outputs and results. I will also introduce you to the bearing schedule and what the values in the table mean and where these values come from. Then we will summarize all the findings. Let's start with a brief introduction uh, and a brief information about my myself, obviously, and Jacobs. Um, I graduated from Strathclyde University in Glasgow with a master's degree in civil engineering in 2013. I have over five and a half years of experience in bridge engineering. My main area of expertise falls within design and assessment of highway structures. Last couple of years, I have predominantly worked on assessments and uh, bearing replacement schemes that require creation of grillage modeling of various complexity. I also have experience in uh, bidding for asset support contract for Highways England. So that's a little bit about myself. Um, let's now talk a little bit about Jacobs and uh, what kind of company it is. Jacobs have over 77,000 employees in more than 400 locations worldwide. We are one of the largest and most diverse providers of technical, professional and construction services. We are number one design firm according to ENR ranking. Jacobs has well established graduate development program with more than 1,200 graduates complete in, in the last decade, as well as Jacobs has recently secured important wins in Highways England routes to market regional delivery partnership. This is a very much a quick summary of Jacobs. Now let's concentrate on the case study itself. Let me introduce you to the East Cliff Viaduct and the background. Now, the East Cliff was built in 1976. It is a seven span, 348 meter long viaduct that connects the A20 at the promenade level to the A2 on the cliffs in Dover, um, just above the um, port of Dover. It carries a three lane carriageway of varying width and a two meter wide footways on each side. In plan, the structure comprises a 1,015 meter radius circular curve, which carries a three lane, 10 meter carriageway over the first three spans. The carriageway is then widened into 12 meters between pier three and pier four. Spans four, five, six, and seven are on 117 and a half meter radius. The, uh, the superstructure comprises a curved seven span in situ post tension reinforced concrete twin box. Now, twin box. Uh, Boxes consist of constant depth single cells connected by a 300 millimeter thick deck slab with the cantilever extensions, as you can see on the picture shown. Piers are reinforced concrete cantilever type. Piers 1 to 4 are founded on a 1.8 meter diameter cast in situ reinforced concrete piles, and piers um, 5 and 6 are founded on um, concrete uh, caissons which have been cast in situ inside permanent sheet pile coffee dams. Now let me introduce the theory behind multicellular deck behavior that was adopted in this scheme. Uh, in here I would talk about general deck behavior of uh, this type of structure bending stiffness and torsion constant, which were two parameters that we were varying uh, throughout the scheme. When created grillage model uh, in MIDA Civil, we considered shear flexible grillage, which reproduces the distortion behavior of the cells. When creating a grillage model, we assume that the grillage mesh 
that is being created is in the plane of principal axis of bending of the deck and longitudinal members are coincident with longitudinal webs as you can see in the, um, in the picture here for this form of construction we split the deck into seven longitudinal members uh, four webs one central one central slab connected boxes uh, and two dummy members on the parapet up stands These four longitudinal members of the deck containing uh, webs are split in such a way as to try to replicate the I-beam. In other words, longitudinal bending behavior can be visualized by notionally cutting the deck between webs into number of I-beams but without full bottom flange. Then the longitudinal bending stresses on these cross sections will be similar to those of an actual I-beam and will be given by equation shown on the slide. Shear stress is built up from two parts. First is shear stress due to bending of longitudinal members. This one is similar to the theory of I-beams. Second, due to the variation of neutral axis of individual beams. Due to longitudinal members being flexed separately, each will result in zero extension along its own neutral axis as shown in the figure on this slide. As a result of these longitudinal members rotating about the points at different levels, it will then create a relative longitudinal displacement. Resistant to this displacement and its reduction will be accommodated by the high stiffness of the top and bottom slab. In order to avoid this effect occurring, it's proposed to calculate I values about the neutral axis of the deck as a whole. No. This can be done by overwriting properties of already created um, sections in sectional property calculator to reflect that the bending stiffnesses uh, or I values uh, have been calculated with respect to neutral axis of the deck as a whole. Alternatively, you can split cross section of the deck into longitudinal members such that the individual neutral axes are the same as one of the whole deck. Now, the second parameter that we manipulated uh, when we were creating grillage model was torsion constant. Torsion as applied to cellular decks considers the shear forces and deformation or as a result of deck twisting and with distortion effects excluded. The constant that you see on the slide reflects half of uh, St. Venant's uh, torsion constant for thin-walled box. This is to reflect the fact that only half of the torsion is resistant by the torque on the longitudinal members with the remaining being resisted by opposing shear forces on the opposite sides of the deck. The reduced torsion constant was then shared between the two longitudinal members that formed the box. Now I will discuss basics of grillage model and how to create a model in Midas Civil. Grillage is essentially a grid of longitudinal and transverse members where longitudinal members are coincident with the center lines of actual beams. Best practice is to use one beam per longitudinal member. This way analysis is easier. However, two or more beams can be used if needed. Regarding the transverse spacing, um, this is very much an arbitrary parameter. However, where, where there is a diaphragm, mid-span or over support, then the grillage member should be coincident. As I previously mentioned, there are seven spans in East Cliff Viaduct. The spans vary between 45 and 52 and a half meters. What we did is we just divided each span by 10. This arrangement also worked well for intermediate diaphragms. However, we had to create more cross sections to reflect those changes. Right. Grillage in Eastcliff Viaduct was created manually by inserting node locations. However, it is not the case for many other structures where MIDA civil wizards can be used and many other useful functions that will speed up the process. Um, there was mainly three reasons uh, why we had to do that. Um, it's because we had a deck of uh, varying width the radius of the deck wasn't constant 
and we had varying spans. So what we did is uh, we created plan of the deck in AutoCAD and used regular XY grid reference to define node locations, which we then uh, copied over to MIDA Civil to create the profile that you see on the slide. Once the nodes are created, we can then proceed to create materials that will be used for the elements. I have created an image to show step-by-step -step procedure on how to define a material. There is a variety of standards to choose from, from British standards to Eurocode, um, which are both on the list. It should be noted that materials created in sectional property calculator within MIDA Civil are not transferable and are only used to calculate section properties. However, if you have steel concrete composite section created in MIDA Civil SPC, then you should define this section as steel when you import it back into the model and use it. This is because sectional property calculator converts composite section into equivalent steel before um, calculating the properties. Now, um, let's touch on sectional property calculator, which is built into MIDA Civil and talk more about how it was used in Eastcliff. Sectional property calculator lets you create any shape you want or alternatively import it from AutoCAD as a DXF file. I personally find it easier to draw a cross section of the deck in AutoCAD before splitting it into longitudinal members and then importing them into SPC for further analysis. This function was essential for us to be able to create Grillage model in Eastcliff Viaduct. Now I'll give you a quick example of how we go about it. Imagine you have a cross section in AutoCAD that you've separated from the overall cross section of the deck. Uh, bear in mind that sectional property calculator does not recognize polyline, so all of your lines have to be drawn as simple lines and nothing else. What you can then do is, is then you, you, you need to save this file as a DXF and AutoCAD lets you do that. Once you save that file, you can then, you, you will then have it in, in your folder obviously. What you can then do is you can go into tools, you'll go into your sectional property calculator, change it to kilonewtons, leave it at millimeters. Make sure that in AutoCAD you draw in millimeters as well. You press OK and then you can just import the AutoCAD DXF file that, that you have just saved from AutoCAD. And there we go. And this cross section appears in here. And after that you can uh, proceed and um, create a properties, um, all the parameters for this cross section before exporting it. I'll show you later on um, how to export the cross section once you've created all the parameters for it. Right. Back to the slides. I have already described how we split the cross-section into longitudinal members. Um, here you can see elevation of the cut-through box section. This image shows exactly how we split the deck into transverse sections. We had 48 different section and uh, properties for most of them were calculated using sectional property calculator because as you can see these are all non-standard cross-sections that you won't be able to find in any of the libraries. So I think use of AutoCAD and uh, sectional property calculator is essential in this case. 
so this image shows exactly how we split the deck uh, into transverse sections. As I said, we had 48 different sections and properties for most of them we calculated using SBC. You can see that bottom slab thickness varies from 250 to 350 millimeters at the support. There is also a diaphragm at each support, along with span variations and above mentioned parameters. Uh, all these things resulted in uh, more sections that we had to create to be able to complete the grillage model. When the properties of the general or composite section are calculated, we can then export it in the way shown on the slide. The exported SBC section is then added to your list of sections for this grillage. This process has been used for most of the sections in Eastcliff, apart from single slabs in transverse direction. So what you what you do once you've created, let, let's just quickly create um, properties of it. We go into section, generate, we use plane. We can just generate the cross section and calculate the properties straight away. Call it concrete and apply here. Now, we calculated all the properties. What you can then do is export, make sure you click my section file, select the path where you want to save it, change your name, member two, for example, save it. Then what you need to do, you need to click on, on the element and click apply. So now, that section has been saved and it's ready to be imported into your sectional into your section properties. By doing that, for the regular sections, you would go in, into values, general section, and import SEC file. And there you go, here's our member two. Then you click OK. Click OK and it adds that cross section. You define a name and press OK and it's uh, in your Madis civil file. So this is pretty much what I have shown in here for you to be able to refer it to it later on if needed. Previously I explained the need to calculate bending stiffness about the neutral axis of the deck as a whole. While sectional property calculator considers neutral axis of the individual section, we can still overwrite parameters in uh, post-processing. We also did overwrite torsion constant parameters that I mentioned. So essentially there, there were two parameters that we had to overwrite to make sure that um, this grillage is considered as shear flexible grillage. Um, which is um, the way the um, multicellular decks are considered. So it's fairly easy to overwrite the parameters on, on the cross sections that you've created. What you need to do is you need to go into the all your section properties, click on a property of any section that you want, and you can just double click and overwrite any properties you want. So this is, this is uh, in Mada Civil, this is your um, torsion, this is your second moment of area. So this is the parameter that you, you would be overwriting for the torsion constant. Back. So that pretty much concludes um, the important aspects of the grillage model creation. Next, I would like to briefly discuss the important component, which is loading. And in order to get accurate results for the bearing schedule, it's essential to apply correct dead and live loadings. In this slide, you can see main user panel that lets you pick the way you want to apply your dead loadings. Easiest way to apply dead load is by using self-weight function. However, in case of Eastlip Viaduct, I used beam load, subtap, to apply uh, loads on longitudinal and transverse members. In doing so, I followed the step-by-step -step process as shown on the slide. Here I select appropriate load case name for which I'll be adding specific loads 
pick a low type and then enter a UDL value in kilonewtons per meter with a negative sign that means force is acting downwards. I normally apply slab dead load and surface in, on transverse members to obtain more accurate stresses when checking transverse member capacities. We also had to apply a specified displacement that was used to replicate jack lifting process. Here we try to see whether the effects of the superstructure the effects on the superstructure were significant. It should be remembered that the assessment of any detrimental effects on the structure when it's lifted have to be checked as part of bearing schedule, uh, as part of bearing replacement scheme. Bear in mind that when you create specified displacement at the node, it automatically creates a support at the same location. So now let's talk about live loads. A lot of you are probably aware that MIDA Civil introduced assessment code BD2101 to already existing Eurocode BD3701, to existing Eurocode and BD3701, which are design codes. For this particular scheme, BD3701 and Eurocode were used for bearing design, and BD2101 was used for assessment of the deck during jacking. MIDA Civil makes it very easy to create all important combinations such as HA plus HP. HA plus uh, SV and SOV and um, Eurocodes LM1 and uh, LM3. In order to apply these live loads, we first need to create lanes of traffic. I previously mentioned that carriage width with varies between 10 and 12 meters. This has a knock-on effect when we create notional lanes. On wide deck, we end up with four notional lanes and on narrow carriageway, three notional lanes. The table you see on the slide comes from BD2101. This code limits maximum width of the notional lane to 3.65 meters. So there are two possible solutions to reflect variation in number of notional lanes on one structure. First, we can create two independent MIDAS civil models reflecting two sections. This will simplify outputs and reduce number of combinations and make it more straightforward to obtain required reactions and forces. Or there's a second option where you can use a single MIDA civil file to create both scenarios. This can be done by creating more number of lanes and overlapping them. Then it will be necessary to create the relevant live load combinations and take into account the lanes that are applicable to original model one or model two. So what I mean by that is when you have a deck of varying width, if you can see here, we have a wide deck and at a certain point here it starts narrowing until uh, we end up with a 10 meter wide deck. So this has an effect on the traffic lanes that we create. So this Live, uh, this uh, traffic lane arrangement reflects the um, white deck scenario where you can see we have we allowed space for the footpaths and everything seems to be running curb to curb. Everything is pretty smooth. And then at some point, when the deck starts narrowing, the lanes shift to the edge, which is not a true representation of um, the loadings. What you can do then is you can um, create a load mod, uh, three different lanes that would reflect load model two. And you can see that starting from uh, the point where you have narrow deck, your traffic lanes are back to normal. But if you go to the, the wide deck, you can see that there's quite a bit of space left unused which is not realistic and it's not uh, according to the code. Um, I, I show a bit better here um, and for you to refer to on, on, on this slide. Right, uh, there are two possible solutions to reflect the variation in the number of notional lanes. So, um, as you can see, you can create two different models or you can uh, create everything within one model. 
in here you see a window where I show steps on how to create a vehicle to BD2101, which is assessment code. It is done by following BD3701 standard and then clicking to use appropriate HA lane factors to reflect assessment code you want to work with. Default factors are adopted from BD2101 clause 5.24 and for BD3701 uh, it's table 14. You can also consider reduction factors uh, based on um, the quality of the road and, and, the, and the amount of traffic when working with BT2101. <clears throat> so once vehicles that we are intending to use in the model have been defined, we then proceed to create traffic lanes. To do so, we follow this path. We click on the load tab and then on to move and load then we click on traffic line lanes. We will then see the window that is shown on the slide. When working with a grillage model, we have to use cross beam, uh, we have to use cross beam vehicle at low distribution to account for effects on both longitudinal and transverse members. The cross beam group can easily be created by clicking on the uh, group in the tree menu and create a new structure group. I will show you it in the more detail in, in a bit. Last point in the table is reference line. In our case, we just picked all the lines that form a longitudinal member, which also defines direction of the traffic lane. This is done by clicking function in selection by tab. Once all the parameters are in, including the eccentricity of the lane uh, with respect to the reference line that you, you've created, uh, then you just click OK to create a lane. And uh, we can also check to make sure that it lands in, 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 the, light, in the right spot. Once the traffic lanes have been defined, we can then create moving load cases. Referring back to the two different approaches on how to accommodate variation in number of notional lanes, screenshots on this tab show where we consider two different lane models within one MIDA civil file. We can select lanes that reflect model one and use them to create live load case where, uh, with appropriate vehicle. We can create as many combinations as we need. We then repeat the same procedure for model two. So um, if you have a working model and you, and you want to create live loads, we want to create moving load cases and you have uh, two different um, carriage width with that effectively represent two different uh, notional lane scenarios. You can then select, for example, if you're working with the load model one, which is a wide deck scenario, you, you select the lanes that will be appropriate uh, for that specific load model and you click OK. So that's it, your HA plus HP scenario is created. And you, the only thing that you will need to do is you need to make sure that you know that this live load distribution is for load model one scenario. So don't you don't confuse it with anything else. The same thing will apply for load model two when you can just go and create um, load model two. With, with, with the same, but obviously you won't, you won't be doing that in here. You, for example, load model one, load model one, HA plus HB. Then it's an ultimate limit state, or you can pick serviceability limit state, which is um, part of um, HA plus HB auto com combination. Then you click OK, your load case is created. And then let's say you want to create a load case, the same load case, but for load model two, then you would just go to selecting your lanes. You create lane seven, eight, and nine to represent load model two scenario. And then you go HA plus HB. And that's it. Here you have a load model one scenario, load model two scenarios. Even though on here, lane one to lane four and lane seven to lane nine, they overlap. They won't overlap here because they are part of different load cases. So there's, um, you're still right in doing so. Just 
that. <coughs> Excuse me. Another function that I found very useful is ability to create structure groups. This comes handy when looking at specific elements within the structure. This way I'm able to request outputs for transverse central slabs, longitudinal diaphragms, or any other elements that form part of the structure. It's very easy to create a structure group. I'll quickly show you how it's done in Midas. You should also bear in mind that when you create traffic line lanes, and you use a cross beam, you will need to create a cross beam structure group, which is also done in the same way. And it is here. I, I, I tend to have uh, both tree menus, tree menu one and tree menu two, and then you can just proceed and create a structure group. For example, uh, transverse diaph um, at pier six, and then you can go in here. <laughs> Select a diaphragm, and you just drag and drop. And that's it, your structure group is created. So once you created structure groups, you can then request outputs for them for a specific load case or load combination. You can select one or more structure groups at the time within records activation dialog, uh, which pops up when you follow the path uh, that I wrote on the slide for you. Let's now talk about outputs a little bit. In this section, I'll concentrate on combinations, maximum and coexisting forces, and maximum and coexisting reactions. Latter two especially played an important part in assessment of the structure during jacked stage. To create any load combinations inclusive of any loadings applied upon the structure, you just have to click results and then load combinations. Now, traditionally, I tend to create all load combinations in Excel after I extracted separate static and live load cases and then multiply them by safety partial factor from the standard that I'm working with. This was the case for this bridge as well, since uh, there's a lot of output and it's easier to document, record and track findings this way, as well as uh, share it with the other members of the team that are working on the same structure. However, all loads that form part of the load combinations can be multiplied by the individual partial factors within MIDAS Civil, which makes it very useful if needed. Now, main use of maximum and coexisting forces function falls within the assessment, assessment side of the superstructure. In addition to step-by-step -step procedures shown on this slide, I will show you how this function works in MIDAS. What you need to do if you want coexisting forces, you need to go into your analysis, click a moving load case, make sure that normal and concurrent forces are selected and you and you and you press OK. What you'll need then to do is uh, perform analysis again, but to make to make it quicker, I've already solved it for us. So what, what you can then do to find concurrent forces, you can go into force. And for example, you want maximum and concurrent forces for the element 220 and HA only max. What you can see then is you can uh, click on view by max value item. You know that all your max values are written down and you're looking for a maximum bending moment and uh, torsion and shear forces will be associated. What happens then is that you see 717.34 kilonewton meters is a maximum bending moment for element 220 at node 446. And bear in mind that these are also maximums. Then you can go into 
maximum and coexisting forces where you requested an, an output for maximum bending moments and everything else in this case will be concurrent. This is a useful function when uh, you calculate the capacity of the members. Maximum coexisting reaction functions played an important role in providing the most out of balance situation that temporary works will need to be able to withstand. For us to obtain these reactions, we need to follow slightly different steps than the maximum coexisting forces. Let's have a closer look in Midas. Again, just a quick one. What you can do is go into load, you can go into settlement, then define your concurrent reaction group. Now, this PS support node is created in the structure group that you, you see in here, where you have to click all the nodes that sit on, on the support. And then you drag it to the selected group and you press OK. Then you'll need to solve the model again for maximum uh, and concurrent reactions. And in terms of output, what you will then see is when you select all your parameters that you want, you can request for HA only max and you can click apply. So to, just to make sure that this is correct, what you see in, in this table is, let me click here, this, these columns show um, reactions for the node where 500 is the maximum reaction. So let, let's, let's see what, what we have in here. We have maximum HA values. Oh, for some reason, they're slightly offset. Never mind. We have 1,487.7 which is an element 500. And in here we have 1,487.7. Now, all the other ones, 501, 502, 503, the, these are concurrent with that being maximum. And in this way, we were able to put temporary supports and uh, define a new structure group with te these temporary supports built in and um, create an output for the most out of balance situation on uh, temporary works such as uh, trestles and um, <coughs> sorry and um, the different kind of temporary works that we used in uh, Eastcliff viaduct now um, this concludes part what I presented the theory behind multicellular deck behavior and how to create grillage model for this form of construction in MIDAS civil as well as some essential MIDAS civil functions that we have used in the scheme. Now I would like to introduce you to bearing replacement side of the scheme. I will introduce you to the bearing schedule that must be completed. I will talk you through the parameters within the table and explain what they mean and how they are obtained. Now, bearings are designed to BSEN 1337. This standard has 11 parts. Part one contains general design rules as well as bearing schedule template. Part two includes sliding elements, these sliding elements form part of the bearing. Part three to part eight defines the quality standards and design standards for different bearings. Part nine deals with measures to protect bearings from effects of the environment which could reduce their work in life. Part 10 and part 11 of the standard are inspection, maintenance, and transport storage and installation, respectively. On this slide, you can see typical bearing schedule. This table contains all information about the new bearings for a bridge. This schedule needs to be completed by the designer. Table contains important information such as design loads, displacements, rotations, maximum bearing dimensions, and other. After completion of the schedule, it is normally passed on to bearing manufacturer involved in the scheme for detailed bearing design. 
majority of bearing manufacturers have the spreadsheets which allow engineer to get the feel for the size and the properties of the bearings to aim for. However, detailed design of the bearing is required to confirm that it passes all the requirements listed in the schedule. There is a variety of bearings that can have different properties and can accommodate a wide spectrum of vertical loadings, horizontal loadings, deformations and rotations. BSEN 1337 part 1 has most common bearings defined. On this slide I showed part of the table 1 <coughs> from BSEN 1337 part 1. Apart from pot bearings, this table also contains elastomeric bearings, spherical bearings, steel rocker bearings, roller bearings and cylindrical bearings. For this scheme we had to specify three different types of pot bearings. These are free bearings, guided bearings that were guiding expansion and contraction to the point of fixity and fixed bearings which provides point of fixity to the deck as well as means of horizontal load transfer to the foundations. Now this table also contains some important information that will be used in the bearing schedule. If you look at red border you will see two columns, relevant parts of the standard and number. The number column assigns a number to each bearing like 2.1, 2.2 and so on. So when you pick a bearing from this table and the number that is, it is marked by needs to be copied to the bearing schedule into cell within row 2 called type of bearing. As I previously mentioned, East Cliff Viaduct has a curved deck profile. When bridge was designed and built, bearings were aligned radially. For curved decks, there are normally two different bridge articulations, tangential alignment and radial alignment. A continuous bridge needs only three horizontal restraints to be statically determinate. It is normally achieved by one longitudinal and two lateral restraints. For example, one fixed bearing and one guided bearing. For curved multi-span bridges, careful consideration of the alignment of the bearings needs to be considered as it can have consequences on uh, movement of the expansion joint. In MIDAS Civil, most rigid supports are defined by using defined supports function within boundary tab. When you use rigid supports, you assume that bearing does not compress under vertical weight. It should be noted that elastomeric bearing stiffness can vary significantly, thus affecting load distribution. This is particularly important factor when working with highly skewed and curved bridges, where a high proportion of the load can be attracted to the bearing on the obtuse corner if the stiffness of the bearing isn't defined and rigid support is used instead. To define bearing with stiffness, spring support should be used. On this scheme, spring supports were used to replicate temporary supports. On the permanent condition port, bearings were used. As these are very stiff supports and have very little vertical deflection, it is acceptable to use rigid supports in MIDA Civil. For you to be able to use uh, to um, apply stiffness to the bearing, you can use point spring. What it lets you do, it lets you create create any stiffness you want in any direction as well. So this is the rotational stiffness and this is a def uh, deformation stiffness. So if you want um, to use, for example, uh, an elastomeric bearing with uh, a specific stiffness, um, spe specific vertical stiffness, you can uh, then write down the stiffness in this window, select your your element, uh, select your node uh, where you want the bearing to be applied and click OK and your elastomeric bearing will essentially be created. If you need to apply more parameters you can obviously do so but this is a parameter responsible for vertical diffraction or in, in this case it shows Z direction so up and down. Now, let's discuss further how table B1 is populated. The uh, table B1 is uh, the one from BSEN 1337 part 1. Um, and let's also discuss how MIDA Civil can provide information to do so. Let's start with seating material. 
in this section we define material that will come in direct contact with the bearing. It is important as it can affect design and finishing of the plates. Average design contact pressure is overall vertical force divided by the area of application that can be resisted by material coming into direct contact with the bearing. Normally, bearing replacement schemes are carried out on a like-for-like -like basis. However, standard changes and change in bearing type can affect the applied contact pressure triggering the requirement to check that material uh, upon which the bearing uh, sits uh, can cope with anti-bursting stresses and edge sliding of the bearing. In accordance with the requirements of PD 6703, which is guidance on the use of structural bearings, the, the bearing shall be designed to meet the loading requirements of BS 5400 part 2 as implemented by BD 3701. These loadings uh, shall be overwritten by the corresponding combined permanent and vehicle load effects derived in accordance with the Eurocode 1 if the latter are more onerous. So a detailed analysis of the grillage model in MIDAS Civil to determine maximum design load needs to be carried out in accordance with the above mentioned standards which is uh, BD 3701 and uh, Eurocode. The highest values then should uh, be selected and um, written in the schedule. Another component in the bearing schedule is displacement. Displacement of the non-fixed bearing is calculated from the point of fixity. In case of East Cliff Viaduct, this point of fixity is bearing at Pier 4. Displacement occurs as a result of thermal expansion and contraction of the deck. To calculate such displacement, we use the equation shown on the slide where L is the distance from the point of fixity to the bearing under consideration. 12 times 10 to the power of minus 6 is coefficient of thermal expansion and contraction as defined in BS 5400 part 2. To work out degrees in Celsius, you can use step-by-step -step procedure from BS 5400 part 2 or BD 3701. Let's continue with uh, looking at other parameters with bearing schedule. Rotation is calculated due to live load only. It has been assumed that there will be no positional or rotational movement as a consequence of permanent, in other words, irreversible load effects because it, essentially the structure has been built. All the deformation has already occurred and the only thing that we will need to accommodate is for live load traffic. This is normally the case with the bearing replacement schemes. Therefore, all rotations associated with the application of live loading are considered to be reversible in this case. I have already mentioned that East Cliff Viaduct has a curved deck. It's important to understand that all rotations at supports will be given with respect to global axis. Therefore, in this case, rotations may not be correct because longitudinal members don't follow the line of global X or Y axis. It is necessary to create node local axis so that the rotation outputs uh, are in line with the longitudinal members. And I'll quickly show you how it's done. I've also shown it on the slide. So what you can do, because you see that, let me on display. So you see that the global X and Y axis are not in line with the longitudinal uh, members. If you imagine that we have a support over here, we don't want to provide rotation in that direction. We want to provide rotation in that direction. So what you can do is that you can create node local axis. I prefer to use vector. <coughs> Excuse me. Where I first create local x-axis and then I create local y-axis. Once that is created, I press OK and my local axis for this particular node only has been defined and um, you will need to do that for all, for, for all supports. Then when you go to the results, you can find it in displacements. HA only. So all these rotations in here 
will be given uh, about the global X and Y axis. What you can then do, you can click on displacements local, click HA max, but I've already predefined uh, for two supports at that peer, uh, at peer six. Uh, if the local axis have been defined, it will then show you rotations about those local axes, which is quite a useful function. So these values will then be added to the bearing schedule. Next parameter on the bearing schedule is maximum bearing dimensions. This is just maximum dimension of the bearing that the bearing shelf can accommodate. You should also consider allowance for steel plate, uh, certain distance from the edge of the bearing shelf and potentially concrete upstand. You need to provide dimensions in both longitudinal and transverse directions. Overall height of the bearing should also be provided. Um, there might be cases where the spacing between the soffit of the deck and bearing shelf is limited. So um, I think that concludes the bearing schedule part of the webinar. In this section, we have covered most of parameters that were provided for bearing design on Eastcliff Viaduct bearing replacement scheme. One of the last topics I would like to quickly go through before wrapping up the webinar is comparison of the results from two different models. I will explain what I mean in the next slide. All post-tension structures, uh, which Eastcliff Viaduct is, <coughs> require CAT3 checker. With Eastcliff, this was the case. What is interesting is that original design and check procedure was carried out using different software and using different models. In Jacobs, we used Midas Civil to create Grillage model, which is in essence a 2D model. Checker used uh, different proprietary software and created space frame, which is essentially a 3D model. Initial concern was that if the outputs varied by a high margin, it will then be hard to get to the bottom of the underlying causes of these output variations. However, as you can see from this slide, we were able to achieve very much comparable outputs. If you look at um, the window in green, this uh, shows the percentage difference. Our design loads were consistent throughout the structure with overall differences not exceeding 10% either way. The only parameter we, uh, where we were getting substantial differences was rotation. Now, however, due to the fact that 2D and 3D models were compared, compared against each other, there was no easy way of figuring out as uh, to why these parameters are so different. So the solution in this case was to take the highest rotation value um, from design or check and add an extra installation tolerance of uh, 0.03 or 5 radians um, to uh, make sure that we're on the safe side of, the, of that. So in this last part of presentation, I would like to discuss the positive impact Midas Civil had on this scheme. First of all, I think Midas, is, uh, Midas Civil is a versatile software. It can be used in the scheme to as much extent as you feel comfortable and it can complement established bridge assessment or design practices in the office. It has DMRB codes and European codes built in. Both of these standards are used in the UK for bridge design. Created models are easy to amend. That includes amending any loads, properties, boundary conditions and other. Midas um, has a technical support team and uh, which is uh, very prompt in replying to any technical queries uh, that can come their way uh, and I tend to use them quite a lot as well. What I think, what I personally think was a good result is that the Grillage model that we created in Midas Civil produced very comparable results when compared with the space frame model created in different proprietary software, giving me more confidence in the accuracy of the outputs produced and the fact that we um, selected uh, the Grillage type and uh, created all the properties uh, fairly accurately. So. I think this concludes the fifth webinar. Thank you very much for joining in. I will happily take any questions related to this webinar now. Uh, you can also send an email with your questions to info at midasit.com. If you have any questions related to your model, you can also submit a ticket through Midas customer online support. Thank you again, guys.